Long before European explorers came to the New World, and long before the first white man visited the Kanawha River Valley. In fact, for over 12,000 years, different Native American peoples hunted or lived throughout the area. This was a land rich with vegetation, and animals and humans thrived here. The Kanawha River Valley was part of a great passageway linking the east and southeast with the west. The Kanawha Valley was always a major trade route from the Midwest to the southeast and east coast. You can tell this by the um, different types of shell that came out of the Gulf Coast and East Coast that is found on, um, well, in mound burials first and then later in Fort Ancient village sites. Along some sections of the Great Kanawha, salt was abundant. Salt, like water, is essential to human and animal life. The Kanawha salt area was this extremely important to the Shawnee people and Indian people because the process of boiling down salt, it takes about 40 gallons of water to be boiled down to make a bushel of salt. And in the Kanawha area, it only takes 15 gallon of water. So it was much more productive, much less labor intensive, and it was a good quality salt. And so that made it a very favored spot for the tribal people. This was an Eden, honored and valued by those who came for sustenance. At the center lay the Great Kanawha, a river less than a hundred miles long, a river that remained unchanged for the longest time. West Virginia's Great Kanawha River is formed where the Gauley and New Rivers meet at Gauley Bridge. It meanders in a northwest direction until it flows into the Ohio River at Point Pleasant. The Elk River empties into it at Charleston and the Big Coal River at St. Albans. Some claim that the Kanawha is really an extension of the New River, which flows north from its beginnings in Ashe County, North Carolina. New is a curious name, since it is considered one of the oldest rivers in the world. In much earlier times, it was the Taze River which flowed here and emptied into the Mississippi. Glaciers from the last ice age blocked the path of the Taze, resulting in the formation of the Kanawha and Ohio rivers. About 12,500 years ago, the first Indians hunted large animals like woolly mammoths in the Kanawha Valley, where the climate was cold like Alaska's. As glaciers melted, temperatures grew warmer, similar to today. Native people hunted bear, deer, and small game like rabbits and turkey. They gathered nuts, berries, and wild plants. About 2,500 years ago, they started growing much of their food using seeds of wild plants. This Sodina culture also buried their dead in mounds, some of which are evident today. Later, on small farms, Indians cultivated corn, which became a main part of their diet. About 900 years ago, they began building large circular villages along the Kanawha River and growing crops of corn, beans, and squash. 300 years ago, Iroquois Indians from the north attacked these villages and drove the residents away. By the time the first white settlers came to the Kanawha Valley, all of the Indian villages had been deserted. Although the area was still an important hunting ground of several tribes, including the Iroquois, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Delaware. Well, we know from documents during Dunmore's War in 1774 that there were large fish, there were large catfish, there were muskies. We know from archaeological records that the fish species diversity was quite extensive uh, based upon the middens that American Indians of that era left. We also know that the mussel diversity, freshwater mussel diversity, was extremely high based upon the findings in archaeological middens. When the white men began exploring across the mountains into this area, um, in the early 1700s, it became uh, a, a place. It became a place where they found minerals and so forth that they wanted, and um, it also very quickly became the focus of land speculation. 
we look at America at that point, you realize it was virtually virgin land. Uh, the Native Americans had used it, been a part of it, hunted there. But Europeans found this to be unbelievable. Some of the earliest white men that came, that came into the Kanawha River Valley came as early traders uh, with the Indians because there was always a, a profit to be made by getting hides and, and so forth. But um, almost as early as that, the Ohio Company was speculating on land out in the Kanawha Valley. George Washington was uh, a businessman as well as a great patriot. He and his brother and several other people traveled to Pittsburgh, uh, bought boats, and traveled down the Ohio to the point that was Point Pleasant. Many of the natives in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, will tell you uh, their town was named by George Washington, calling it a Pleasant Point. He only went about 14 miles upstream to check out the lands, and he was, uh, he was really, really uh, intrigued by and spoke of the game that was there the great amount of it. He later would hire land agents who would acquire over 300 and some thousand acres of the Kanawha Valley, including the salt works above the area of present-day Charleston. Washington was not um, uh, totally financially disinterested in any endeavor he engaged in. And where there was an opportunity to make money, you could be sure that George Washington would be in on the ground floor. Something that people don't realize is the last agreed treaty boundary was the Blue Ridge Mountains that Thomas Jefferson could see outside his window at Monticello. So these people who came into the Kanawha Valley were hundreds and hundreds of miles beyond territorial boundaries. So it was not uh, an easy road for them to trespass. There was great conflict about who owned America or what part of America. The French proclaimed that they owned a great deal of it. The English proclaimed they did. The Spanish proclaimed they did. More interesting than that were those people who were migrating to America had little or no interest in who owned it. They were there to travel to it and have a new home, go to the promised land, be where they wanted to be. And most of them followed the routes of the rivers, whether it be going to Pittsburgh or down the Ohio or crossing the Appalachian chain and getting on to the Canal River Valley. After the, the white aliens came in, it became a place of commerce because you had the Kanawha River and other rivers that were meeting that Ohio. So it was a perfect place for trading. Therefore, you would get those early traders who came in. The traders came first and then the settlers would come after. As more and more Europeans came to the North American continent, more and more of them moved west. Keep in mind, they were moving into lands that they considered the Native Americans to be hostile. They would move in and live together in, in communities, many of them building forts to protect their areas. Our communities were being invaded and our people were being killed. People would come settle quickly and then they would explore beyond that point. Our entire community suffered, truly suffered. And so we needed to replace those people so we would try to force those illegal squatters out of the communities, burn their villages, try to encourage them to go back. And some of our warriors would actually try to match physically the way a family member looked and the age of that family member when they would take captives because that's exactly what they were going to be. They were going to replace someone else's life. For decades, violence punctuated the tranquility of the western frontier, ultimately ending by treaty and by force. Forts gave way to towns and villages. For example, where the Elk meets the Kanawha, Fort Lee became Charleston. At the junction of the Coal and Kanawha, Tackett's Fort became a village called Philippi, which is known today as St. Albans. Point Pleasant and Gawley Bridge both prospered. When Charleston was incorporated in 1794, 35 families lived there, and the legendary Daniel Boone was one of its residents. An area just a few miles east of Charleston held major significance. Kanawha Salines, the present-day town of Malden, was a plentiful source of salt, a commodity in great demand by increasing numbers of settlers. 
Back then, salt was so important because it was used as a seasoning of food, but also as a preserver of food, which was even more important at that period because there was no refrigeration and salt was used to cure all types of meats and other food. Early entrepreneurs perfected methods to pump salt brine from shallow wells and use wood and later coal fires to boil the brine dry. Salt was uh, readily available near the surface, but there were increasing uh, uh, interest in, in digging for it. And um, the equipment, the jars and various other bits and pieces that go along with drilling uh, form the basis of the oil industry, which in West Virginia took place uh, on the Little Kanawha uh, east of Parkersburg. Uh, so we can look back uh, to the great uh, international oil industry and find out the drilling techniques were really perfected here. The uh, salt producers here, uh, like the Ruffners and uh, Dickinsons and others, were always looking for markets in the east and the west. And they could uh, float salt barrels uh, on the Kanawha and down the Ohio. The real problem right from the beginning was getting bulky um, cargoes east over the mountains. And this led at uh, the very early time uh, during Washington's period of uh, trying to uh, wrestle um, a transport, transport system over the mountains. And this led to the initiative to move from Richmond, Virginia up over the mountains with a canal, uh, the James River and Kanawha Canal. It was a bold undertaking. President George Washington strongly supported its creation. And none other than the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Marshall, headed a survey party to find the best route through the mountains. The Virginia legislature asked him if he would write a report uh, detailing the advantages of linking uh, the James with the Ohio. And I don't believe anyone in the Virginia legislature assumed that in the process of writing that report that Marshall himself, who had been Chief Justice since 1801, uh, would personally lead a survey party from the headwaters of the James uh, over the Appalachians uh, uh, to the Ohio. Marshall did that, I think, for a number of reasons. First, he was um, a strong opponent of the War of 1812, and this was an opportunity to get away from that. He also was interested in doing it. He, uh, as a young man, had worked uh, as a survey assistant for his father, so he was generally familiar, and I think just uh, genuinely interested in doing it. Marshall was an outdoors type of person. Over decades, a large portion of the canal was built on the eastern side of the mountains, and the canal was improved through dredging and the building of small wing dams. There was a scheme which I find very interesting, and that is called the Central Water Line. And that would run from Richmond, Virginia, uh, to the foothills of the Rockies. And uh, the promoters got the governors of all of the contiguous states uh, to sign on to this. Um, there were estimates, and the big um, block was to try to get over the mountains with a canal. It was later uh, changed into the Kanawha Turnpike uh, for just that purpose. The development of the steam locomotive proved the downfall of the project. Settlement and industrialization increased along the Great Kanawha, the eastern section of the river witnessed the development of salt production, coal mining, and small-scale chemical manufacturing from salt. And we begin to see communities beginning to develop around those discoveries and those opportunities for jobs and occupation and economic development. Along the western section, agriculture flourished. These were agricultural plantations, and agriculture remained the one of the major uh, industries of the Canal Valley well up into the mid-1800s. 
The Kanawha River was the prime transportation resource for commercializing these industrial and agricultural goods. Over time, different styles of boats have been used on the Great Kanawha. An early frontier enterprise was boat building at Kelly Station near Witcher Creek. They actually had a boat yard that built flatboats. So as those uh, immigrants would come across the Appalachian chain and down into the valley by way of the Gauley River or the New River, they would stop at Kelly Station, which is very close to the headwaters of the Great Kanawha, build a flatboat, float down the river. Indians use canoes, either a form called a dugout, which is a hollowed out tree trunk, or a bark canoe, typically with a frame of white cedar and a covering of birch bark. A 10-man canoe could be built within half a day. And um, this was a very efficient way of traveling, moving people and moving goods uh, during the historic period and probably went back to the prehistoric periods also. When the Europeans came in and began to develop trades, commerce on the river, they began to realize they had to do it on a larger scale. And to do this, they created primarily two ways of doing it. If you were a farmer, if you were a person who didn't normally work the river beyond the river, you created a flatboat, which was nothing more than a rectangular box made watertight, and you loaded it with an abundance of whatever you had and floated it downriver with using large sweeps or paddles to control and maintain the boat as you went downstream. But it was strictly a downstream boat. Once it reached its destination, they unloaded the product on board and then they would disassemble the boat. And they used that disassembled lumber, rough cut lumber, for building homes and barns and all kind of things. As people began to want to carry things back upstream, it became far more challenged to them. And to do this, they came up with a boat they called the kill boat. It was an unusual boat in many, many ways. It was built to carry passengers and freight. It was a, a, a long, almost canoe-shaped boat, but with a deeper kill on it. Now keep in mind, there was no mechanical means to propel the boat at that point. So men, very strong, healthy young men, would use 12-foot pike poles with a steel tip on it to literally push the boat back upstream. To do this, they walked along the gunwales of the boat and set these pike poles in the river and pushed. They also had a method where they would take a line, a rope, and carry from the head of the boat out to a tree and they would wrap the line around the tree and pull on it. And they called this cordelling the boat upstream. So this was an, an immensely hard task for those people who were doing this. To do this meant that they spent hours pushing this pike pole, pushing this back upstream. They also were the ones who helped create this word of bushwhacking because they would get close to the bank and they would grab tree branches and literally pull the boat up by holding onto tree branches. For about 15 years, the keel boat was the preferred method for shipping salt and other products downriver. It carried salt down to Cincinnati, which at that point was actually known as Porkopolis because they were killing pigs and, and saving and storing and uh, curing salt pork that was used all over the nation at that point. But they also shipped great amounts of salt to places like Nashville and on downstream to Memphis. While the keel boat was an innovation, it gave way to one of the most popular boats in American history, the Western River Steamboat. On October 20th, 1811, the steamboat New Orleans, designed by Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston, left Pittsburgh for the first steam-powered attempt to navigate the Mississippi to the port of New Orleans. It was a large boat for its day, 148 feet long and weighing 371 tons. And it had an altogether eventful journey experiencing a major earthquake on its way. On January the 12th, 1812, the New Orleans reached its destination and soon began regular service between New Orleans and Natchez, Mississippi. Two years later, she hit a stump and sank, but the New Orleans and succeeding steamboats heralded the era of steam power. It set in motion the building of hundreds 
and then thousands of American Western River steamboats. A uniquely American vessel. Nowhere else in the world will you find anything like the Western River steamboat. Early steamboats were made of wood, ranged in length from 80 to 140 feet. They were 10 to 20 feet wide. Early fuel was wood, but coal became standard. The boilers and engines sat either in the midsection of the boat or at the back, the boat's stern. Hence the name side wheeler or stern wheeler. References to the paddle wheels which turned and pushed the boats through the water. In 1819, the first steamboat attempted to go up the Great Canal River. Uh, it encountered a problem, which had been a problem for all the boats on the river, and this was at Red House Shoal, which was a small ripple or fall in the river. Well, when the first steamboat attempted to go up the river, it could not best the falls at Red House. But the next year, another boat tried it, got up through the shoals, and went on up to the upper of Canal River. With the arrival of the steamboat, it became important to further improve the canal to enhance navigation. Shoals made it difficult for boats to pass through, and Red House Shoal and Johnson's Scary Creek Shoals were the worst, although there were ten shoals altogether. The Virginia General Assembly appropriated funds to cut chutes or channels through the shoals, build wing dams, and remove snags, making the river easier to navigate. Soon, many steamboats plied the waters of the canal. The steamboat dramatically hastened the development of America. Steamboats carried people, freight, and commodities up and down the Mississippi, Ohio, Kanawha, and other rivers, which fed this great drainage basin in the center of the country. This commercial development provided markets for salt, coal, agricultural, and other products which were produced in the Kanawha Valley. The first steamboats were built to carry cargo, but some designs were modified to carry passengers too. These were called packet boats. The packet boat is a boat that carried packages, light freight, and passengers. Now, the packet boats were unique in that uh, as they began to evolve, they were elaborated on by how they were built and the services they provided. They would carry passengers overnight, they would provide him with as fine a food as they could find. They were decorated inside with the very finest of brass, chandeliers, silverware, linen napkins. But the boat owners knew this was the way to get passengers and get patronage. Packet boat travel remained popular for decades. It was a leisurely way to travel throughout the region. Packet boats not only made stops at towns along the river, but also at farms along the way all of which had a steamboat landing. Packet boats served the needs of those who lived along the river, and the role of the packet boat captain was greater than just piloting his craft. During the day, they would wave a handkerchief to get his attention and have him land, or at night, they would wave a lantern. And there were personal relationships developed between these patrons on the shore and the boat owners on a personal basis. They would carry things as small as a spool of thread for a lady, or as big as the cow and the bull that we, the farmer was shipping to market. The Great Canal River and Pittsburgh was one of the major routes because it wasn't that far to come down to Point Pleasant, turn north, and carry on trades going past Wheeling, uh, Parkersburg, on up to Pittsburgh, and back down. So this became a major commercial route as well. Then you go downstream, and primarily there were Great Canal River and Cincinnati packet lines that carried on trades between, of course, the Great Canal River and downstream. You'd get to places like Portsmouth, Huntington, uh, Ironton, on down to Maysville, and on down to Cincinnati. There was still need to ship bulk commodities on the river. And to do this, the towboat evolved. Now, the towboat didn't carry passengers at all. It didn't carry any light freight. But it was strictly a utilitarian boat that pushed large fleets of barges. Initially, wooden barges were built, and they carried salt, sand, coal, other bulk commodities along the river. They were very, very effective. As a matter of fact, they're the forefathers of today's modern towboats, which do virtually the same thing. You begin to see steam ferry boats to carry people from one shore to the other before the era of bridge building. 
you begin to see showboats, floating theaters being towed by boats, carrying on entertainment from town to town along the river valleys. The Great Canal River was a very popular showboat river. Showboats were a fixture on the canal for over a century. They would begin touring in April and present their programs throughout the warm months. They put on dramas, musicals, comedies, and the like, and they drew hearty audiences. The Calliope was a fixture on a showboat, and this large steam-powered organ would announce the arrival of the boat and its actors. The steamboat became the transportation backbone of the Kanawha Valley because it carried goods and passengers cost-effectively, and it opened and serviced faraway markets. In 1846, the salt industry, which had expanded to include furnaces along what is present-day Kanawha City, produced an all-time high of over 3.2 million bushels, using mostly slave labor. By 1850, it began a long decline because new salt sources were developed nearer their markets. The meatpacking industry, which grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, was now centered in Chicago, Illinois. Coal output increased to satisfy the ever-growing energy needs of a young nation, and steam towboats were the workhorses that carried the resource to western markets. Charleston became the major city along the Great Canal, although numerous smaller communities developed throughout the valley. Point Pleasant became a riverboat center where generations of river families worked as boat builders or in river transportation. A section of the Canal River at Point Pleasant became a safe haven a place where ship owners could winter their boats, keeping them free from dangerous ice flows, which sometimes disrupted the Ohio. During the Civil War, the Great Canal was strategically important to both the South and the North. Sentiment in the Canal Valley favored the South, although the North controlled the area during the war, except for a brief period in 1862. After the war, railroads made their way into the Canal Valley and spurs to the main lines opened more of the mountainous terrain to timbering and coal mining. There was an ever-growing coal industry within the valley and coal had become the fuel that was to help create an industrial America. So the transportation of coal was very important. Railroads with their steam-powered locomotives became real competitors to the steamboats that plied the canal, even though the cost to ship by boat were less than by railroad. Railroads did not have to rely upon adequate water level in the canal to transport their goods. For example, on average, only 136 days of the year were available for shipping coal by steamboat from the Charleston area due to river conditions. In 1878, a significant effort was begun by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to increase the depth of the Great Canal by creating a series of 11 locks and dams at strategic points along the river. Dams raised the level of the river, and locks provided a means to transfer a boat from one water level to the next in stair-step fashion. The rivermen were uh, most um, insistent that the river be improved, but they didn't want dams uh, because when the river was high, they could float anything uh, right over the top of the dams. Uh, so the French uh, movable system really uh, fit the uh, situation very nicely. Uh, these were large um, planks, if you like, as much as 14 feet high, four feet wide, and they were propped up against a uh, masonry or concrete uh, dam uh, to hold the water back, but they had props that they could kick out and drop these wickets, and you had a free-flowing river. The principle there was that if they could raise and lower these dams, when they were needed during the summer months, they would be up and create the pools where they could go behind them and use them for navigation. But during the spring when there was high water and during the fall when there was water and winter, they could lower the dams and the river had natural river flow. This was the principle behind the movable dam. And of course, when it was up, they had to use the lock and the lock chambers were built of various sizes depending on where they were built. And to do this, they tried to create a system of these and they really became what I refer to as the stair steps on the river because you went from one level to the next and each time you create a pool behind it and then you went to the next level and created another pool. It was a 20-year effort with 10 locks and dams being built 
and their construction dramatically enhanced navigability of the river. It marked the first time that the canal could be negotiated year-round, except for periods of extreme drought or major flooding. It worked very well on the Great Canal River. As a matter of fact, the, the Great Canal has the distinction of having two of the very first movable dams built on a major river in America. And later, when completed, the 10 locks and dams on the Great Canal River, the first series, were uh, created a situation where the Great Canal was the first river in America to have a series of locks and dams, movable dams on its river. So they had two firsts there. Other innovation could be found on the Great Canal. Ward Engineering Works, headed by Charles Ward, began full-time operation in Charleston in 1880. Over a span of five decades, the company built a number of highly regarded shallow draft boats and boat components, many with innovations that changed the industry. He was one of the innovators in the steam propulsion from the standpoint of powering propellers, not stern wheels. He was inventive in how he built boats, metal boats as opposed to the wooden boats and associated with that. But one of the things he did was he found out how to increase the power of his boilers and his engines to create a better, more efficient vessel. He built a little boat called the James Rumsey, and it was a very small boat compared to the bigger tow boats of the day. When you compare it to size and operation of one of the bigger sternwheel tow boats, the heavy boats that were operating on the river then towing coal, it looked like a miniature. It was propeller driven, steam powered, it was built in such a way as to reduce manpower use on the boat. It was a much more efficient boat, but it was also a very powerful little boat. And it had been sort of made fun of by a number of boat owners along the river when they saw it being built. So he challenged the DT Lane, which was at that time the cock of the walk as far as the big towboats on the Great Canal. And they accepted the challenge. Well, when the pushing contest happened, little James Rumsey ended up beating the DT lane, both pushing it upstream and pushing it downstream. He was an innovator also in doing the dual propellers on boats and the diesel-powered or uh, petroleum-powered boats. So his approach to things was that he could better what was being done in a way to make it more efficient throughout. Charles Ward died in January 1915, but the company continued for several years under the leadership of his son. He got very discouraged with labor problems and threatened to just throw up the whole thing and do something else and Ward Engineering sort of disappeared. The chemical industry expanded dramatically in the Kanawha Valley in the 1900s. In 1915, companies in Bell and South Charleston, each located along the Kanawha River, began producing chemicals from salt. Before World War I, the U.S. Navy began construction of an ordnance plant in South Charleston. But the war ended before the plant was fully built. During the First World War, the federal government purchased a sizable tract of property along the Great Kanawha west of Charleston to build a major complex to produce explosives and chemicals for the war effort. It was the beginning of the town of Nitro, named after nitrocellulose, a component of smokeless powder and explosive. Tens of thousands of workers built the plant in under a year, as well as a complete community with housing for executives and workers, a hospital, stores, and civic center. The complex had barely begun production when the war ended and the government sold the facility to a homegrown corporation, which sold off portions to chemical companies that set up shop in Nitro. By the 1920s, companies named West Vaco, Union Carbide, and others were producing a variety of chemicals from not only salt, but also from coal and petroleum. Additional companies followed, attracted to the region's salt brine, high quality coal and oil, and natural gas. These companies used river transportation extensively. Trucks from pickups to large freight haulers became popular and competed with steamboats, especially packet boats. In the same time frame, the diesel engine began to replace steam power in river boats. 
Stonewall boats was so slow and they had to float around and back up. It took them so long to get any place that so you get a diesel boat. <laughs> you can steer a lot better, you can back up a lot quicker and you can show more cargo. <laughs> didn't take as many men because you carried your fuel all in the hull and just a little old pump that pumped that oil up to the engines and you no, know, it was a very different thing. Just based on power. power is exactly what it was. That, yeah. So the diesel came in because it used less manpower, it wasn't covered by any regulation, it was far more efficient. So by the time you got through World War II and the end of the 50s, the steamboat was gone. After severe flooding, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began the task of replacing the original locks and dams on the canal with a more robust system, this one of German design. By the great uh, flood of 1927, um, the original uh, wicket dam system needed repair, particularly locks uh, four and five, and there was a concern by the Corps of Engineers uh, to rebuild these uh, dams. It wasn't the locks, it was the dams, which were crib dams, built like a log cabin and filled, uh, the cribs were filled with stone, and they had rotted out. And the decision uh, was made to replace them with another foreign system, um, the great roller gate system of the Germans, and that was uh, put in after 1927 and finished um, in the next decade and a half. And these big roller gates are still here. They didn't build movable dams, they built stationary dams. Within the stationary dams, there were gates, sometimes called tainer gates, sometimes called roller gates. These gates could be raised and lowered, creating the pool levels behind them. They could be lowered to let more water through, or they could be raised to retain more water behind them. They also had lock chambers. They were larger, much more modern, easy to use. They also, at that point on the Great Canal, they did something rather unusual on the, the abutment side, the non-lock side of the dam. They built water power generating plants to be used for peak power generation. Today, these uh, projects are still in use. During World War II, the federal government had a plant built at Institute to produce synthetic rubber. And a new synthetic rubber industry was created in short order to support the war effort. The Ordnance Center in South Charleston was put to full use during the war, producing guns for battleships, air-to-ground rockets, torpedo flasks, and other munitions. In 1944, 7,400 worked there, half of them women. Output from these industries was crucial to the war effort. The chemical industry in the Kanawha Valley continued to grow, reaching its peak in the 1950s. Literally hundreds of chemicals were produced at factories from Bell to Nitro. South Charleston became known as Chemical City and the region as the chemical center of the country. The influx of highly trained chemists, engineers, and administrators to the chemical industry invigorated the social fabric. The pool of young men available to Charleston, young women, uh, was increased dramatically, and a lot of this resulted in marriages. Many of them married Charleston girls. And this produced a, a social uh, scene that was far different than it used to be. It was pretty dramatic. I mean, you had uh, a symphony, you had uh, a light opera guild, you had uh, um, the Kanawha Players, which had been sort of an old group here, was stagnant, it came alive. And all these things that uh, uh, you talked about in the major cities came to Charleston. Obviously, they were much smaller, but uh, you had them so that the Charleston became by far the most uh, a cosmopolitan city in West Virginia. Because of the Great Kanawha River, the valley and the resources that lay beneath the fertile soil, a complex modern society had developed over a relatively brief time frame. But with that growth came harm to the river. From the earliest salt works, oil seeping from salt wells 
found its way into the canal, and the boatman who transported the salt downriver gave it the nickname Old Greasy. All along, industrial byproducts were dumped into the river. As cities and towns grew larger, the canal was forced to swallow ever greater amounts of sewage and municipal waste. The chemical industry became a major polluter. By mid-20th century, the canal was gravely ill. Well, in the 1950s, we, of course, had a great deal of discharges from chemical industries, um, from, um, from sewage, but there were legacy pollutants like the sediment that filled the streams starting in the um, early 1800s from all the agricultural developments in the Kanawha Valley and its surrounding tributaries. So sediment doesn't move out of a system like the Kanawha River very rapidly. It takes a great number of large floods to get it on moving on out of the system. Once the locks and dams were put in, then that was an impediment to movement of sediment out of the Kanawha River system. So a combination of legacy sediments, uh, impounded parts of the river, which kept the sediments from being flushed out, and then large quantities of chemical plant discharges and sewage plant discharges and discharges from other manufacturers that were dependent upon the chemical industry as a basis and uh, discharges from coal mines into the tributaries of the Canal River. All of these things made the water quality of the Canal River in the 1950s uh, come to a very low point, could barely support uh, aquatic life. Government passed a series of laws to limit pollution and clean the water. Over time, the canal has become healthier, although dioxin and other industrial contaminants still lie on the riverbed. Today, the Canal River is improving and is approaching, uh, in some degrees, what it may have been like in the 1700s. Now, um, still has a long way to go, uh, but we're seeing more and more species of fish come into the river system, some of which are returning from being here in an early era. Uh, we're seeing that mussels are starting to come back in parts of the tailwaters of the impoundments created by the lock and dam. So the water quality has obviously improved. We, uh, we rarely have a problem with dissolved oxygen in the river these days. Uh, the fecal coliform bacteria uh, levels are generally within tolerable ranges, ranges we expect to see. The sewage has been cleaned up in most of our larger communities along the Canal River. We still have some problems with the uh, smaller tributaries where um, there's still failing septic systems or perhaps no septic systems at all, but even those are improving over time as money is made available to build new sewage treatment plants or extend sewer lines up these tributaries. Of the known uh, chemical pollutants from chemical manufacturers, we uh, are now seeing better regulation uh, all of those known chemical pollutants are treated in uh, modern water treatment plants and that has been a big plus for the Canal River. We also have better regulation on the mining industry, on the discharges from the mining industry. We have uh, very little acid production these days coming from newer mines. We have abandoned mine lands programs which help to control some acid discharges from old abandoned mines that uh, were abandoned long before modern legislative rules that control discharges from such mines. So uh, the Kanawha River has really made a big improvement. While it may never be pristine as it was in earlier times, the Great Kanawha commands respect, although it does not avoid abuse entirely. The Great Kanawha River has played a significant role in creating present-day society remnants of its rich history can be found almost everywhere. From the burial mounds of Indian cultures to the turnpike that helped link a growing nation. Photographs of a bygone era document the changes, while a cherished memory from childhood helps bring them to life. My earliest memories of the river begin about 1927 because um, we rented a house on Kanawha Street, which was this two-lane street was there before the boulevard and I could see the steamboats running up and down the river and the friends I made uh, were all guys of course obviously my age and uh, we got an old John boat and um, eventually we got a Maytag motor and we built a stern wheel on it. So 
I spent all my spare time playing around the river. I mean, that was a big deal, you know. And the DT Lane, I remember her because she always had big trailers and we always waited for her because uh, if you're out in the river and you can get in her trailers, you really gotta, it's, it beat a trip to the Atlantic Ocean, really. <laughs> I guess my most vivid memory is all the, the buildings down below the, uh, the levee or the landing in Charleston before Haddad Park, because there were a lot of buildings clustered on that bank and houseboats strung down between there and Elk River. But there were a lot of them along the bank down through there. And the stores came out, and of course, and a lot of them didn't look very secure. They really overhung the bank, and every time the river came up, of course, it came up under the stores on that piling, and they all caught a lot of drift. The Liberty, the last regularly scheduled packet boat on the canal, left Charleston on its final departure in 1936. Operating into the 1950s, the Majestic was the last family-run showboat on the canal. We'd start our season from Point Pleasant, and we'd stop at all the little towns up Canal River. And by that time, we'd have the show, all the actors would have the axe down and have it down pat. By the time we got off the Canal River, then we'd hit the Ohio. But we would show all the towns, every little town community on the, on the Canal River. All your small towns didn't have any theaters, just your cities. And most of your small towns was tickled to death to see a showboat come and look forward to it. The P.A. Denny provided cruises on the canal for nearly three decades before it went to Ohio to become a floating classroom. The Charles Ward Engineering Works built the boat in 1930 for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It was known then as the Scott named for the engineer who designed the original Canal River locks and dams. The Delta Queen, commissioned in 1927 and a National Historic Landmark, toured the rivers of America until 2008, but it was forced by a new law to no longer carry overnight passengers because of its wooden construction. Fewer excursion boats make their way up the canal and elsewhere, the River Explorer, with a towboat pushing its twin barges modified for overnight river trips, provided passengers a unique boating experience and made an imposing figure on the Great Canal, but ceased operations in 2008. There are celebrations of stern wheelers and river life. The Charleston Stern Wheel Regatta took place from 1970 through 2008 and became very popular as an end of summer extravaganza. The Point Pleasant River Museum houses river artifacts and displays, and it boasts a sophisticated pilot house simulator. The town celebrates with a yearly regatta, and on its river flood walls are murals which portray river history. St. Albans has a popular summertime river fest, and in the warm months, people flock to the coolness and relaxed pace of the Great Canal. Throughout the year, commercial towboats push a substantial amount of coal and other commodities to market, as they have for over a century. The new Winfield Lock, which is 800 feet long, our forebears wouldn't have known what to do. I went down in it before they let water and you felt like an ant in the, in the bottom of a bathtub. Um, the Winfield Lock and Dam is the busiest lock and dam in the entire Corps of Engineers system nationwide. And that just gives you some idea of the tonnage that goes through uh, the Kanawha River into the Ohio. The tradition of river life and the celebration of its people live on in name and in memory. Great Kanawha retains the character of industry to the east and agriculture to the west, while it nourishes a number of towns and cities that grew up beside it. 
There are those who share a reverence for the Kanawha River, past and present. Some yearn for the stern wheelers of yesteryear. A few were lucky enough to make a living on the Kanawha. They retain vivid memories of a storied past of dads and granddads, generations of rivermen, and of families who lived with the river. These were the youngsters who grew to know the great canal in their hearts. When I was growing up, I knew I was going to be a pilot because my dad put me in the pilot house when I was big enough to stand up at the wheel and just barely see over it. So there wasn't any question what I was going to be. You know, my whole life has been on the river. And it started on the Kanawha River. It's a whole lot better than what it used to be back years ago. You didn't get any days off. You got on a boat, you worked until you just couldn't stay any longer. Then you got off and there was somebody to take your job. So you had to stay on the boat for two, three or four months because once you got off, you didn't know if you was going back to that boat again. Towboat wife, they, they had to raise the kids, take care of all the bills, they done everything. And, and when you was gone, and it was a pretty hard job for them. A lot of people I know that worked on the river have been married three and four times. I've got the same wife, she's been with me for 53 years now. And she's raised our family, so she gets the credit. The first week was pretty tough, being away from the family. But then you get grooved in and you, you forget about it, you think about your job. Then about a week before you get ready to get off, you're anxious to get home. A river man is a, is, is a rare breed because you've got to have a love for the river before you can stay with it. And you've got to love your job. You've got to like what you're doing. Every minute that I was out there, I, I loved it. And I, I miss it. And every chance I get, I'll, I'll go out again. <laughs> 